We're here today with Doan Farmer, um, who is a professor at the Santa Fe Institute, um, and he's also one of our inaugural grantees of the INET uh, grant program for a very ambitious project titled An Agent-Based Model of the Current Crisis. Um, and what this appears to be is an attempt to create a high-fidelity model of the, all the institutions that were involved in this crisis. Um, how are you going to do that? What's the idea here? Well, the idea is you try and model an economy based on its elements, the actual people in the economy. So we get data on real people, and we model things at the level of real people. We model their decisions, uh, including the things they buy and sell, like houses. Mm -hmm. And we try and predict the price of houses based on inputs like uh, how much money people have, what kind of loans they're able to get, how much houses are being supplied, and so we really try and build what's called an agent-based model. Where now when you say model, this is a computer model. It's a computer model. Mm -hmm. So it's a simulation in a computer of people. The people are all different from one another. It's critical that they be heterogeneous agents. They really have uh, the variations from person to person, from check checking account to checking account that real people have. So the idea of this model then is to create an artificial world that is however very much like the actual world and calibrated in some way to the actual world. Is that right? That's exactly right. We're, we're, um, we're trying to get a simulation of the economy that's faithful to the economy where we see macroeconomics emerging from the microscopic interactions of individuals. And, and how do you calibrate it? This sound, I mean, th this is a lot of detail. There's a lot of detail, and to calibrate this kind of model, we need to get data that economists are not normally uh, after. So we're looking around for data on individuals. Fortunately, every time a home is purchased in the United States, there is a record of uh, who purchased that home, uh, what, what did they fill out in the form that they filled out to get the loan? It actually turns out that um, it's handy. There's a, a major data set that's uh, to prevent discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, racial discrimination. As a result, they ask people a lot of questions because they want to be able to go through and make sure that statistically people are not being discriminated against based on their race. Mm -hmm. So you can model the housing market pretty well because of that data. But in this crisis, there's also all of these financial markets and things like, and you're going to do those as well? Well, we're, we're trying to take things one piece at a time. Okay. And so we're starting with the housing market, where in the housing market, we think the major thing that all of the fancy um, mortgage-backed securities and so on did is to enable people to get loans that couldn't get loans before and to get different types of loans than they got before. So whereas in the old days, you had to put 20% down for your uh, housing loan and you'd pay a fixed interest rate, in modern times, uh, you might be putting almost nothing down and you might have a funny balloon payment loan that required you to pay very little for the first two years and then suddenly start paying a lot more. Now, the availability of those kind of loans meant that lots of people could buy houses that couldn't buy houses before, and so you had a big surge in demand without a corresponding surge in supply, which is, we would argue, what drove housing prices up. And so the first question we want to ask is, can we show that the fact that these uh, subprime mortgages were allowed at all is fueling the bubble? The bubble. Or are there other things okay. uh, driving it as well? And because part of what we do is we get data from periods where those subprime mortgages weren't available, and then we can see whether we can correctly predict housing prices during those periods. I see. And then we can go to the periods where it is available and see whether we can predict the difference. Ultimately, our goal is to have a model of the whole economy. But our immediate goal right now is to just model housing, the housing bubble, and um, try and um, avoid modeling anything we don't have to model. I think there's a, there's a big challenge in doing this kind of thing because, uh, as, as you've already hit, a lot of detailed data needs to be done, a lot of moving parts in a model like this, a lot of places where you have to make decisions about what you're going to put in the model, and the hard part is always modeling the decisions that real people make. This sounds like a lot of work. You're not doing this by yourself, are you? Thank God. I've, I've got some fantastic collaborators. I'm doing this together with Rob Axtell, who's one of the 
supreme gurus of agent-based modeling. Um, Peter Howitt, who is a macroeconomist from Brown, and John Genicopoulos, who is a microeconomist slash housing expert from, uh, from Yale and Santa Fe Institute. So each of you will take a piece of this project, or you, or they're consultants to you, or how does that work, that collaboration? No, we, we're working on this all together. We're, um, we have a phone call once a week. We actually meet together with a couple of students and a postdoc, and we're having a week-long workshop in May. Uh, we just met for several days in New York uh, in February. So we take every chance we can get to try and get in the same place and try and talk on the phone once a week. And it's very much a collaborative project. As you were saying, this is a new approach. So yeah. you must think that you have something to offer. So what's, what makes you not happy with the existing approach? Well, there's two existing approaches. One approach is an old one of building econometric models. Keynesian and neo-Keynesians were already trying to build those kind of models. Mm -hmm. Those kind of models, though, what they do is they, you take a bunch of data and you more or less arbitrarily fit functions to the data to try and make predictions about what's going to happen in the next time period. And that approach is valuable, um, but it only really allows you to deal with things that you've seen before. As long as the world in the future is like the world in the past and the relationships between the past and the present are staying constant, then you can use this method. But if you suddenly get into a zone regime you've never seen before, then the, the method is guaranteed to fail. And in fact, the Fed took their model of this style, it's called Furbus, and in 2006 they asked Furbus, uh, what happens if housing prices drop by 20%? And Furbus told them, not much. Now, Furbus was wrong. Furbus was pretty wrong. Okay. It was off by a couple of orders of magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the problem with econometric models. Now the other kind of model is a DSGE, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Model. And those are based on the idea that the economy is in an equilibrium. Now that's a mathematical model. It's a mathematical not a, model. Not a, not a computer model. Well, it's, it's both because it starts out being a mathematical model. Mm -hmm. And the, the hard part and the real uh, straitjacket that you put in when you make such a model is you do have to formulate it as a analytic model where you can solve what the rational agent would do. So they're predicated on the idea that agents are rational and there might be some uh, frictions like sticky prices and a few things like that. But basically you're looking at what a rational agent would do. You have to be able to compute that. And, and then once you write the model down, you put it in the computer and you use nice statistical estimation techniques, a maximum likelihood to estimate the parameters of the model. The problem with those models is in order to make them tractable, there um, many simplifications are made. For example, they're made to be linear, mm -hmm. which means that if you want to explain the business cycle, linear models don't easily deal with cyclical behavior. They don't deal with the nonlinearities that are inherent in uh, say limit cycles and oscillatory behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you pretty much are forced to uh, treat the business cycle as being driven by technology shocks that then cause the model to jitter a little bit, but it's constantly going back to equilibrium. And so I would argue you've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. The whole methodological approach throws the baby out with the bathwater because you're forced to linearize the model. I believe the business cycle is inherently nonlinear cyclical phenomenon where the cycles are actually endogenous to the system. They're coming from inside the economy itself, not from some you know, lightning bolts of technology shocks that Zeus right. is throwing down from on high. And secondly, because of all the issues about tractability in these models, you're forced to make extreme simplifications. So the DSGE models that were around before the crisis didn't have liquidity, didn't have banking in any realistic way, didn't have default, didn't have any of the things that drove the real crisis. Mm -hmm. And so as Duncan Foley and I said in an essay in Nature, um, the models weren't even good enough to be wrong. <laughs> um, now, one of the reasons that you're, you're comfortable in, in doing this new economic thinking is because, in fact, you're not an economist. Is That's that right? right? That's right. I, um, I'm trained as a physicist, mm -hmm. and my career has been in dynamical systems theory, in time series analysis. 
I ran a hedge fund. Was it the hedge fund experience that made you interested in modeling the economy, that using your physics tools and background uh, and seeing if that could somehow help you understand, I suppose, asset prices in this case? Well, if you want, I can even give you a little bit yeah, tell farther, me. I'm longer interested. rollback. I started my, during graduate school, I, I built the first concealable or wearable digital computer, which I built to beat the game of roulette. And that's what got me into the prediction business because uh, it caused me to think a lot about prediction. Then I got interested in chaotic dynamics because I was fascinated at the idea of unpredictability because I'd been beating my head against an unpredictable system for a year and a half. Um, so I ended up doing my PhD on chaotic dynamics. And, but meanwhile, my particular expertise was on prediction. So I was doing time series analysis of fluid flows, sunspots, ice ages, all kinds of things. And some clown would always raise their hand and say, well, have you tried applying this to the stock market? So when I was going on being at Los Alamos for 10 years, and I didn't want to get the little nut dish they were going to give me, I said, okay, screw it, I'm going to leave. Started this company and did that for eight years. And as you correctly surmised, that got me very interested in economics. So you started with asset prices, and, and, and now your new project is really expanding to the entire economy. To what extent was the financial crisis the, the impetus for this third stage in your life? Um, well, the, the financial crisis really made me think about doing something that mattered. I'd been, for the last 10 years, working on models in financial markets, um, not trying to predict whether prices are going up or down, but trying to understand the regularities in financial markets. Why are some more volatile than others? How does that relate to other properties like liquidity and so on? And I'm pretty pleased with what I did, but the financial crisis made me think that well, the real nut to crack is to be able to predict things about the macroeconomy. And as I learned about what we were actually doing, I realized that there was a tremendous opportunity. Um, it's always good to go in something where the bar has been set very low. <laughs> um, well, this sounds like a very ambitious project, and uh, we're looking very forward to seeing what you come up with. At, at INET, we think of new economic thinking as new thinking about the economy not necessarily by economists, but we're happy to welcome you to our stable of INET economists, if you'll have us. Oh, very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you.